Hi everybody, this is Julian from Hogging Face. As you can see, I'm not in my usual settings. I'm in California for a couple of conferences, but that won't stop me from doing another YouTube video. So what is this one about? Well, as we know, building data sets is a very time intensive and you know rather painful task, especially for computer vision data sets. We need to collect images, we need to label them, etc. And I thought, can we use stable diffusion, which is a generative AI technique, to create synthetic images that we can add to existing data sets instead of you know, scraping the web and cleaning images and, and resizing them and labeling them. Well, that's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to create new images using stable diffusion. We're going to add them to an existing data set and we're going to retrain a model on this new data set and we'll see how that goes. So this is going to be a fun one. Stick around. In a previous video, I showed you how to use AutoTrain, our AutoML service, to fine-tune an image classification model on the Food 101 dataset. And as the name implies, that dataset includes 101 classes with different types of food. Okay, and it's a it's a public dataset on the hub. So starting from this, and uh, an AutoTrain. I created this model, uh, which is public as well, and um, this one lets us classify food images. So let's grab uh, maybe this one. I don't know. Yep. Okay. And uh, and we can score food images against those 101 categories. Okay. And this one was pretty accurate, 91.5 percent. Okay. So if you want to know how this model was created, go and check out that auto train video. I will put the link in the video description. Of course, the model only knows about the 101 classes that are part of the data set, right? So, and we can see them here. Um, so what happens if we try to predict an image that shows something else, right? So let's say I want to predict an image showing boeuf bourguignon, which is one of the most popular uh, meals in France and one of my favorites. Right? Beef, mushrooms, carrots, red wine sauce. Amazing. Try it. Um, if we predict this image, you know, it tells us steak, which is not totally wrong because yes, it is a beef, uh, uh, it is a beef-based meal, but it's not, it's not steak, right? And the rest is is awfully wrong too. So that's the problem I want to solve here. I want to, I want to teach that model how to predict additional classes, okay? And as an example, we'll use Boeuf Bourguignon. So, of course, we know what to do here. Um, we need to collect images um, that show, uh, you know, plates and, and, and meals uh, with Boeuf Bourguignon, add them to the data set, and train again, right? With 102 classes this time. But the problem is, you know, where do you find those images? So, you know, you of course you could, uh, I guess you could go to Google and, and you know, you could you could try Boeuf Bourguignon, and you could scrape those images, right? But then again, you know, you would have to uh, write the code for that. You need to resize them. Uh, probably you would need to remove some of them because they're, you know, they're not exactly what you're looking for etc etc so that's a very valid way of doing it but i thought you know i want to do it differently today so what i'm going to do as mentioned is i'm going to use stable diffusion uh, which is uh, and this is the latest version at the time of recording 1.5 and i'm going to generate images that i can add to the data set and showing you know buff bourguignon right and that should be you know i guess easier and quicker than scraping the web for whatever images I, I need. Okay, so let's try this. So um, yeah, we can't use the inference API for, for this model, but uh, we have a bunch of spaces here. So let's try and uh, see if that model can actually generate the samples we need. Okay, so that takes a few seconds. Let's see. If that's you know good enough, precise enough, and you know realistic enough, 
Well, it's not so bad, right? It's actually very good. So let's do this. Let's generate a thousand images because that's how many images we have in each class in the original Food 101 dataset. And we'll add them to the dataset and train again. Okay? So let me switch to the stable diffusion notebook and I'll show you how to do this with very little code. So in this first notebook, of course, we start with installing some dependencies. And the main one is the diffusers library that lets us work with those stable diffusion models. We need to log in to the hub because that's how that uh, stable diffusion model is configured. You know, it needs uh, logged in users. Um, and then, um, you know, it's super simple. Uh, thanks to the diffusers library, we can create a pipeline just like we would create a pipeline with the transformers library. Okay, so grabbing the model, uh, we're going to use the FP16, uh, which will let us predict uh, much quicker than if we were using full precision. And there's no difference in, in the quality of images. I, at least I couldn't see any, right? So that's a really good, a really good trick, this one. Of course, we want to make sure that pipeline is running on a GPU. I'm using a, a GPU instance here with a, a V100 GPU. Okay, so download the model and then uh, we can generate our images. So the generation itself is super simple, right? It's just uh, the pipeline, the text prompt, um, how many images we want to generate for each uh, prompt and and other technical parameters like guidance scale, which I'll come back to, okay? So the number of images you can generate in one go depends on the GPU memory that you have. So here, I can do four, okay? I can do four uh, in a round, which is what we saw here, okay? So if I want to generate, let's say, a thousand images, I need to invoke the pipeline 250 times, okay? And that's why I have this uh, double uh, nested loop here. Uh, because first I'm going to iterate on uh, on I mean you know how many times I need to invoke the pipeline, and then of course I'm going to iterate on the four generated images and save them. Okay, so very simple code. That's what I'm doing here. Right. So what about this uh, guidance scale parameter? So th this is actually a parameter to give more freedom or less freedom to the model to go and and generate images. So 8, which seems to be a good default value, will generate uh, images that are you know, strictly um, uh, compliant with your text prompt. If you go with lower values, um, then you give more freedom to the model to, to explore. Okay, and we're going to try this. Okay, see how it goes. Okay, so let's generate maybe, yeah, 8 images with the default value for the guidance scale and we want to display them. So let's run this. And this is very fast, you know, it takes about 10 seconds for for those four images. So you can do a thousand images in just under an hour. Right, which is pretty fast. Okay, so I can see my generated images, right? And they're good. You know, this one is just maybe a little bland. You know, there's not so much stuff in there. Okay, so let's try and do maybe images with a little more freedom, right? And maybe we'll start seeing other objects appearing in the pictures, which would be nice because, you know, it creates more diverse images. And I guess it makes the, the model work harder at figuring out what's the actual context in that image. Okay, so you can see we have multiple plates. We have silverware, which we didn't really see before. Sometimes you get a glass of wine. Uh, I have a few pictures like that. Yeah, we see bread, you know, additional objects, more plates. Yeah, I think generally, you know, this is, this is more interesting uh, because if you have, you know, a thousand images that are centered, you know, right on the meal and, and nothing else is, is visible in the shot. It's not so realistic. So you want to have more, you know, a little more chaos in that picture. So uh, lowering that guidance scale uh, parameter will give you that. Okay, so 
um, I could just do this, you know, just say, okay, now do a thousand, <laughs> which I've already done. Like I said, it takes about an hour. And, um, and these are saved to a local directory. So let me switch to the directory. I'll show you the pictures and then we'll see how we can uh, add them to the data set. So about an hour later, I get my images, right? And here they are, a thousand images. And you know, we could look at a few, but you know, we've seen some examples in the in the previous notebook, and you know, generally they're they're very good quality, right? So now, how do we add them to the data set? So the Food 101 data set, which you can get on uh, which you can get on Kaggle, right? Uh, looks something like this. And of course, here I renamed it Food 102 because it has an extra class. Okay, so it's a it's a simple you know, structure. We have one folder with each uh, type of food, and of course, this is going to be the label for the class. And so, what I did is simply this, right? I just created a new folder, and I copied my images in there. Okay. And that's it. Okay, that's all it takes. So if you have this image structure, uh, image folder structure, it is super straightforward to add data to it, right? If you have a CSV or or JSON lines folder um, structure, you know it's not much more difficult. Um, but you know the image folder is very convenient if you want to add more data to it. So now we have food 102, right? And we don't have a, we, we, it's not split yet, okay? It has only a, a training set. So we have the data, and now we can move on to building a hugging face data set for this. And, and next, we're going to train, okay? So let's build a data set. Here, we're going to start from that image folder data set and turn it into a data set that we can push on the hugging face hub. So for this, of course, we need to have Git LFS installed. Uh, these are the instructions for this machine. Uh, shouldn't be too different on yours. Uh, maybe you need to replace yum with apt, but that's about it. Okay, um, of course, we need to be logged into the hub because we're going to push the data set to the hub. Uh, we can use the super convenient image folder um, uh, format to load uh, from the folder into a hugging face data set, right? So just point the loader at the top of the tree, so to speak, the file tree, and it's gonna load all those files, right? Just like that, I love it. Um, of course, we can check that we have 102 classes, we can check we have all our class names, including the new one, no surprise there. Then we can split for training and validation, okay? And uh, here we have a default 25%, uh, if I'm not mistaken, for testing, okay? And we can just push this to the hub. And as we say, voila, right? And if I go to the Hugging Face Hub, I can see my data set right there, right? And I should be able to browse it. Okay, here we are. So now that we have a hugging face data set ready, we can move on to the last part, which is fine tune that original model that I created with AutoTrain on the Food 102 data set and see how that goes. Let me switch to that notebook. So if you're familiar with the trainer API in the Transformers library, I guess you already know what I'm gonna do here. You know, this is uh, very similar and that's great, right? Because that's easier to understand. So, of course, install transformers and datasets, import some classes, load our dataset from the hub, okay, the one we just uh, packaged and, and pushed, okay, and it's still the same, 102 classes, all the class labels, right? Uh, we can easily build a mapping between the class IDs and the class labels. And vice versa. That's going to be useful to uh, to have, you know, uh, human readable predictions. Okay. Uh, and then I define the base model that I want to fine tune. So this is the one we saw earlier. Okay. So this one was trained on Food 101 for um, for a few epochs. Okay. And we're going to train for a few more. 
on food 102 this time uh, I've gone for a really small learning rate because this is really you know very fine tuning so let's see if that works the batch size eval size uh, FP16 again uh, is, a, is a huge time saver uh, we'll evaluate after each epoch and that's about it right okay so, so next we download the base model okay passing the labels the mappings uh, this one is important because the the classifier layer of the model is going to change right the original model is 101 um, output uh, classes the new one has 102 okay so we need to resize it and uh, if you don't set that mismatched uh, size parameter to true you're gonna get a, an error but it's pretty self-explanatory so uh, even if you forget it you can figure it out um, next I need a transform function and this really does two things it's going to convert the images to a red green and blue format and it's going to pass them to the feature extractor um, uh, for the, that model, which applies um, a resizing and uh, normalization, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, And so we just apply that to the full data set. Next, we define the collator function to make sure the batches have the, the proper format with the proper features, pixel values, etc., right? which is what those models expect. Uh, the metrics function, so here I'll just uh, output accuracy. Um, I left the code here if you want to see F1 and precision and recall, but it's going to be per class. So you're going to get 102 F1 scores and 102 precision scores. So, you know, it gets a bit messy. So I commanded it out, but feel free to, to use it if you need. Um, the training arguments where I just put everything together. Uh, there's nothing particularly uh, crazy here. Uh, then the trainer, of course, the model, the arguments, the feature extractor, the collator, the metrics function, uh, the training set, the eval data set. Okay. And then I call train, right? And so um, I run for three epochs. So again, that's about an hour, uh, 20 minutes for, for one epoch here with this data set. And as you can see, um, I improve pretty pretty rapidly on the accuracy, right? The base model was 91.5, and after three epochs, you know, I'm at 93.4 almost, okay? So, you know, maybe we could push it a little more, but, okay, I guess an hour of training is good enough. So that's, you know, that's a very, very accurate model. Very cool. And then we push it to the hub, right? And then we're done. So now, if I go back to the hub, I can find this new model, which is a SWIN model, by the way. I forgot to mention that. But if you want to try this with a, a vision transformer, it should work the same. Uh, I believe the, the feature extractor is the same as well. And, uh, and so, yeah, 93.38 accuracy on, the, on those 102 classes. So now, of course, if I try my image, hey, this is properly scored, right? Very cool. So there you go, right? Um, a bit of a, I guess, a bit of a weird technique, um, but, you know, I think it's actually quite simple. Um, it took very little effort to generate those images, and this is a very scalable process, honestly. If I needed 10,000 images, I would just, you know, I would just let it run for 10 hours, or I would just maybe use a, a multi-GPU instance and then scale things a bit. But, uh, you know, once you have this, you know, you can generate any number of images uh, you can generate any prompt you know if you wanted to try um, if you wanted to try something else I don't know you know chicken teriyaki or whatever uh, you know you can add uh, you know as many classes as you want um, and to me this is much simpler than, than going and trying to find the appropriate number of images on the web and scraping them and worrying about you know am I allowed to use those images and how much work do I need to process them? You know, here 
they're going to be the right size. Uh, they're going to be the right quality. I can get as many as I need. And this is actually a, a rather fast process. And then, thanks to the datasets and transformers library, it's actually quite easy to, you know, uh, augment your datasets and retrain your models. Um, and, uh, you know, it's one hour of data generation and one hour of training, and, and we get the, you know, extremely, extremely good uh, 93.38 accuracy, right? Which, you know, I have to say I was surprised to get. So didn't expect it to be that good. Anyway, um, I guess I found a real life business use case for stable diffusion. So uh, yeah, I guess it's all fine if you want to generate crazy pictures and, you know, dragons and unicorns and whatnot. But, you know, if you want to get real business done with stable diffusion, this is one way to do it. All right, that's it for me. Um, I hope you liked it. I hope this was useful. And I guess I'll see you when I'm back on the other side of the pond. And until then, keep rocking.